Hello, students, and welcome to yet another session of Communication Law, Ethics, and Diversity. In our last session, I discussed the First Amendment. Today, we move to speech distinctions and the First Amendment. So now I'm going to move right along and share my slides with you. And so you would recall that there are a couple of areas we spoke about or touched on the last time in terms of your rights, my rights, and the rights of the audience of citizens to actually have access. But today there's some things that I'd like to share with you in terms of speech distinctions and those particular areas, those arenas that are not necessarily protected under the First Amendment. Now, most of you would recall the incident that took place on the 6th of January following the last elections. And so the Supreme Court really has ruled that speeches that incite violence or unlawful action is unconstitutional. Now, for those who are following or who are following the January 6th commission, you would recall that the major thrust of the argument around the um, case that you know was brought against former President Trump really pertained to incitement. It was felt that his words were fighting words and that he led those persons who marched onto the Capitol to commit acts that were unconstitutional. And so because whatever the particular court hearing was centered on the constitution, that's the reason why I'm bringing to your attention something that is still very relevant and recent in our history as it relates to distinctions in the First Amendment, starting off first of all, with the whole notion of incitement. Now, going back to the very early cases in law, in terms of incitement, you see that in Schenck versus United States, 1919, that was way before we were here and our grandparents in some cases, the court established that incitement is actually a type of what we call unprotected speech. Now, the reason for that is because in that particular case, Shen distributed flyers inviting people to ignore the draft or being drafted into the First World War, all right? And so the court rules that Sheng's actions amounted to clear and present danger, which is described as incitement. But clear and present danger in itself really turned out to be a rather vague criteria that was applied by the court back then in 1990. Let's look a little closer at that particular case. Now, choosing a street while looking both ways can be considered dangerous. I'm sure you would agree with me. If you're actually crossing a street, if it's a very busy, busy inter intersection, and we're talking about crossing a street without looking both ways, immediately we know that's dangerous, all right? You're looking for um, death, or you're looking for an accident to happen um, on the part of the pedestrian. It's going to be very dangerous. The, 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 the pedestrian has to be looking, as well as the driver. Um, we have situations where drivers are pretty distracted and they're actually not looking. So crossing a street without looking both ways can be dangerous. That is very clear. And should people who look at their phones when crossing be arrested? So these are some questions that are going to be posed for you to think about vagueness and the fact that if you're making a statement, there has to be clarity to be interpreted, to act upon. And here's an image that I put here with this particular explanation. Oh God, don't die. You know, you're texting and driving, you're clearly distracted. Some pedestrian, a child steps out in the middle of the street and you know, as fate would have it, you're, you're, you're looking up in time just to slam on the brakes. In some cases, there's not enough time to react or to act and there's an accident that results in death. So crossing a street without looking both ways, this is something that will constitute danger. And we know that there's no uncertainty or vagueness in the language or vocabulary where that particular warning is concerned. Now, due to the uncertainty and vagueness surrounding the particular Schenck case that I just spoke about, which happened really to define incitement about 50 years later as a result of that particular citation of vagueness. And so they said here, that really in overturning the conviction of Brandenburg in the case of Brandenburg versus Ohio in 1969, this is now 1990, a member of the Ku Klux Klan or what, Klan or what we call the KKK, he made a couple of inflammatory statements. And this is what he said at an upcoming 4th of July rally that the Klan would get revenge on anyone supporting African-Americans and Jews, all right? Brandenburg versus Ohio, 1969. Here's a member of the Klan actually saying the word revenge, all right? Go back now to 
the 6th of January, 2020, some of the issues that would have preceded the march on the Capitol, and think about the words that were actually spoken and how the court or the trial really, um, I would say emerged and evolved using the particular words that were made to lead the, those particular folks to the march, all right? Now, the word revenge was actually taken to be very, very serious. So Scotus, or the Supreme Court of the United States, said that it would only punish advocacy that is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. What the court ruled effectively is that Brandenburg's speech did not result in immediate lawless action. It did not meet the requirement. So here is someone saying that the Klan would get revenge in anyone supporting African-Americans and Jews, but yet the court ruled that he did not incite or he did not direct his particular arguments saying that I'm going to get revenge on Tom Jones or anybody else named because the court is saying that it is not likely to, to incite or to produce such action. And so they're saying that his speech did not result in immediate lawless action. Again, I'm sure that we can say Coming years later, this is not what has occurred because we cannot assume that people who are listening are rational thinkers and that they're not going to by what we hear and they will not act upon it. Now, the Brandenburg test really brings us to this whole notion of speech and the nature of speech and advocacy when it comes to the First Amendment and those speech distinctions. And so whether speech advocates immediate lawless action as compared to speech that advocates lawlessness at some point or in the future are only conditional, it's said to be imminent. So the court really put imminence to the test really in ruling in favor of Brandenburg back then, years after that particular 1919 um, um, trial that occurred in the first place. So the Brandenburg test really speaks to whether speech is likely to produce imminent lawless action. That is, if there is actual lawless activity immediately following the speech or likelihood, that's when it's going to be called unconstitutional. So it's about imminence in the first instance, it's, and it's about like, likelihood. We know we're not living in a society where in some cases you've got to wait until it occurs, but it's likely to happen. And so there has, there has to be preponderance, a preponderance of evidence to support that. And I'd like you to read Brandenburg versus Ohio. If you take this particular link and you go into your browser, you're going to see the case coming right up and it's going to just really let you know what happened, what preceded this particular issue and how the court ruled in favor. Now, apart from those particular types of incitements that I've cited here under the Danger, Schenck versus United States, 1919. And when we come to Brandenburg versus Ohio in 1969, there is also what is called the true threats. True threats are statements where the speaker means to communicate a serious expression of an intent to commit an act of unlawful violence against a particular group or individual. All right, so what is not protected, number one, incitement, number two, true threats. So let's examine this a bit closer. The true threat doctrine is in the case of Watts versus United States in 1969, whereby Watts, upon being asked what he would do if he was drafted for Vietnam, he said that he would get, and I quote LBJ, President Lyndon B. Johnson, in his crosshairs. I'm gonna get him in my crosshairs. So this is what he said. And this is what the court responded. They said that, well, it is not as serious as you guys are actually making it out to be. Some of the people who heard, they said, hmm, this is ridiculous. We've got to really tell on this guy, you know, what's is actually making a threat against the president. And the court said, no, his comments were not a serious expression of intent, meaning that he was joking to say that I'm going to get the president in my crosshairs. It is not a true threat. That was what the court ruled, all right? Now, as far as the court is concerned, to be considered a true threat, the speaker need not actually intend to carry out a threat. He must only indicate seriousness. So they must deem the seriousness of the threat to be sufficient to take the person into account and to charge them and to deem their words to be true and sufficient enough that they're, 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 they're going to actually carry that particular thing out, all right? So again, the court ruled in favor of this guy who said that he was going to get the president in his crosshairs. It was not deemed to be an active, serious case against the president. 
No. Apart from true threats, there is what is called intimidation. And it is, it's, it's actually a type of true threat where the speaker directs a threat to a person or a group of persons with the intent of placing the victim in fear of bodily harm or death. And so somebody's name is called, they probably remember, still Tom Jones. And so Tom Jones is actually fearful. I'm going to dismember Tom Jones in such a way that he will scream until he dies. If I were to bring you real cases that are happening right now, you would see that recently in the case of the intrusion by the guy who is now before the courts for intruding into the home of former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and actually damaging or um, attempting to um, you know, harm, he actually did bring harm to her husband um, by just using the hammer. And you know, it's said that he's going to take months before he recovers. He's out of the danger zone, but it was a true threat. It was really an intimidation um, directed at the person. He said that in his own words. He went there to speak with the, the Speaker of the House um, to actually get the truth out of her. And if it is that she did not give him the truth, she was going to, he was going to actually break her knees or do something terrible. All right. So this is intimidation. It's a type of true threat that was admitted um, by the person who's now charged and before the courts. And so in, in, in the time and the era that we're actually living in, I hope that, you know, we've been able to look at what is happening in the news and to associate all of the, that, that we're hearing with these particular court cases that have happened years ago and the way in which the court is actually looking at things differently right now. Because, like I said, we're not necessarily all rational beings and we're living in a situation where persons believe every single thing they hear. And if there's a conspiracy theorist out there, they're going to believe and they're going to act upon, oh, it's, you, you know, we, we really need to do X or Y. We really need to take action against people who are actually holding us hostage in the economy or whatever it is. And so the true threats that you're seeing or the courts are acting upon or the feds are acting upon or the intelligence community, it's as a result of what has happened and the harm that has come to people in the past and the, the things that people continue to do to protect themselves and their families, all right? However, there is a caveat when it comes to intimidation. Intimidation that is not directed at a specified recipient is not considered a true threat. So if somebody says that they're going to harm, you know, somebody, um, you know, threatening to harm, you know, blacks, it is not considered a threat against a specific individual. But if they're saying that they're going to harm former President Barack Obama, or they're going to harm somebody who is like Ben Crump, or somebody who's always in, you know, in defense of some particular group of people, then it becomes a problem. For example, if they say that they're going to harm all Jews, it is not considered a threat against a specific Jew. But if they're going to harm Spielberg, or if they're going to harm somebody um, who is known to be a Jew, somebody who is in public in, in, in the public eye or as a public figure, then it becomes a problem. All right, then it becomes what is called um, a true threat um, in the case of what the court has ruled to be unconstitutional or speech that is not actually protected because it's considered a true threat. So intimidation has to be directed at a specific recipient for the court of law to actually say that which you've actually said, we're going to hold you accountable for it. And we're going to charge you with actually committing a true threat because you said you're going to harm Carolyn Walker. You're going to harm somebody who is actually in the class by name because this is what you said and we are holding that against you as a real threat to the person. Now, threatening to harm, you know, you know, if, if, if you're going to name someone, you're going to, let's say, the person's name is Bishop Carroll, all right, or threatening to harm Carol Baskin. Um, this is really different and it's specific enough. That's what the court says. Um, it is not necessarily, you know, all the people around her, but it's this particular individual because it is very, very specific to a true threat. Now, political hyperbole, it's important to note that political hyperbole it is not considered a true threat. When the president threatens war, it is not a true threat because he's just basically saying, oh, we are going to take our country back. We are going to make sure that we actually wage war against whoever it is that is threatening our democracy. Um, it is not a true threat because presidents are in a place where they will say those things and they will do that when it comes to protecting stuff like that. So it's not a true threat when he threatens war because that's the language associated with assurance. Um, um, you are showing the entire um, populace that you, you have their backs and stuff like that. And so I want to tell you that you need to read Virginia versus 
back 2003. Again, if you copy and paste, um, you can find those particular cases. I'm going to try as much as possible to make sure that they're there in detail, but I've highlighted it so that you can put it directly into your browser and you will see this with respect to true threat as one of the cases. Now, we come to the third, unconstitutional, what is called unprotected speech, and it's called fighting words. Again, fighting words have to do with that which is spoken. It's like venomous. It's like bullets you're, you're, you're actually using, and it's going to cause disturbance to whoever is actually receiving the words. So fighting words are statements that by virtue of being spoken or written are likely to elicit a violent response or disturbance from their target. Now, remember we spoke about incitement in the first instance, and then we say true threats. Now, fighting words are very, very strongly associated and related, but they must be directed to the person who responds violently, all right? Can you think about any incidents or issues that pertain to fighting words? Fighting words were introduced in Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire, the case in which Chaplinsky was actually blocking a sidewalk and he was delivering a pointed speech against organized religion. Now, Chaplinsky <laughs> really was directing his um, fighting words against the marshal when the tongue marshal approached him, carrying goddamn racketeer, a damn fascist, right? So the marshal arrested him because he was actually directing his fighting words against the marshal. And that's the reason why the case ended up, you know, in the Supreme Court of the United States. And this is what the court said. The court said that and because of its nature, it was likely, highly likely, to elicit a violent response. Perhaps there would have been a fight that would have broken out between the marshal and Chaplinsky. But proving fighting words is probably one of the hardest tasks to undertake in a court of law. And so courts rarely classified speeches as fighting words. Think about that. Think about how in election cycles, during election cycles, when we hear ads, we hear a lot of fighting words. So perhaps we need to have some reform or to re-examine what constitutes fighting words. The name calling, the mudslinging, the different ways in which you hear opponents referring to each other. In some cases, some opponents exercise restraint. They select their words carefully, but in other cases, there is this, you know, sort of, there, there are no filters when it comes to the words that are used to describe another party. Statements really directed about um, a group or a are by nature not directed at a particular individual. These statements are not considered fighting words, all right? So if you say, all of you are lazy um, or all, you know, um, Jews are bastards or all Blacks are really laggards or, you know, all whatever it is, a particular group, all immigrants are, you know, coming to take jobs or whatever it is. These, you, you, as long as you're not necessarily naming someone, you're not naming an individual that represents that particular group, then it's not considered unconstitutional, so to speak. So you can talk about the immigrants all you want. You can talk about who are the people who are an LGBT community. You can talk about those who are Muslim, um, Christians, Jews. They're not going to be considered to be dangerous or they're not going to be considered to be fighting words unless you name someone in that particular group. All right. That's not Dr. Walker saying that, but this is based on what the Constitution says in the context of what can be deemed to be unconstitutional in the context of fighting words. So you've got to name people. All right. But these days, things are changing drastically in the sense that you can become anti-Semitic um, based on your particular sentiments about a particular group. You can call a whole group niggas or whatever it is. Um, you'll be looked at in a very strange way because uh, they will ask you, what century are you living in? If you're going to be branding or labeling an entire group of people based on your words. But again, this has to do with statements about a group or a class of people. Um, not directed at a particular individual, they're not considered fighting words unless you pull somebody out of that group and you're claiming or you're stating that they're always doing X or Y or they're, you know, you're going to do whatever it is against them. Um, that's when it's going to be taken before the courts. Now, fighting words, an example here that I've given before and I'm going to reinforce here, is if you use insults against 
gays or lesbians or Christians or Muslims or Asians. And we know there's been a rise in the attacks against Asians. There has been this, um, you know, sort of um, period, an era when Muslims went through a whole lot of, um, I would say, profiling post 9-11. Um, in some cases, Christians, you know, in some cases, the LGBT community, um, they've got to be very mindful and careful of the attacks because there have been a couple of attacks in times gone in terms of the nightclubs and all of that. Blacks and rich people and poor people. This is really not considered fighting because you are just using your words and not necessarily weapons, but you're using your words to say things about them. In some cases, you may put that on your social media profile. Some of us are actually guilty of laughing at the insults, but the court does not rule it to be very um, egregious to those groups. They don't rule it to be fighting unless you're actually pinpointing or pointing out one particular group of people um, by name, all right? In fact, the Supreme Court has actually ruled that hate, um, race, color, is actually constitutional. But I want to hazard a guess that things are changing. Hate speech is no longer embraced. It is not embraced, but this is something for us to actually think about in the context of what we can actually take to the court of law um, when it comes to if um, someone is actually using hate speech on the internet to create some sort of incitement. When we come to fighting words and a case in terms of Texas versus Johnson 1989, where the Supreme Court ruled that offending people by burning the American flag, it's not an instance of fighting words and that burning the flag is actually unconstitutional. I've got a note here that says, make sure you read the brief. So you are not required to actually read the brief um, because this has to do with briefs that I had previously put up. Now, this struck me the very first time that I examined this whole notion of burning the flag. It is not fighting words and it's also not um, unconstitutional. And I thought from all of the different types of debates around burning the flag and kneeling and all of that, that really was some sort of constitutional um, conflict that emerged as a result of those particular instances. But in the Texas versus Johnson case in 1989, this is when the Supreme Court ruled that offending people, it is not necessarily confined to an instance of fighting words that we can associate it with, uh, associate it with the flag, all right? So this is not me, it is really the court ruling in Johnson versus Texas in 1989. Similarly, in the Cohen versus California case in 1971, the Supreme Court ruled that being offended by a message on a shirt is not enough for fighting words to be claimed by an individual. So if you're actually wearing something that says, hail Satan, if you are an atheist, it is not known or seen as fighting words. Or if you have some sort of t-shirt that says Islam is of the devil, then you're not seen as someone who's promoting fighting words. However, and I'm going to say a big however here, Wherever you're working, or agencies or entities or organizations reserve the right to say or to state what the dress code is. In as much as these are not fighting words, because we're living in an era when this is a very, I would say, not necessarily sacred, but this is a very sensitive thing to do, to wear a t-shirt that will offend, even though it's not deemed to be a fighting word, agencies and organizations, they reserve the right to inscribe or to say, our dress code includes X, Y, and Z. Anyone found wearing, um, you know, uniforms or shirts or t-shirts inscribed with certain whatever it is, they will not be allowed in. Or our dress code is in effect. We don't want you wearing things that will be of offense to a particular religious group or anything like that, all right? Some places can actually do that. We live in a free country and you have a right to wear whatever you want to wear, but I know of some public places that have a right, they reserve a right to say to you, you ought not to come in wearing a particular um, outfit or a t-shirt emblazoned with these types of um, representations, so to speak. So be very mindful, um, not because Cohen versus California 1971, the Supreme Court rule that, you know, these are not fighting words. Agency, agencies do reserve the right to say, um, who can and cannot, in some instances, um, when you can wear it. You, you can actually do this if you're um, gathering, you're exercising your First Amendment and you're actually making a case for a particular ruling or you want to draw attention to a particular policy. Um, in that particular context, you can. 
But if you're certainly walking into an organization that is really trying to promote religious freedom um, and the CEO of the company deems it to be insensitive to actually wear a t-shirt that says Islam is of the devil, um, he's going to, to put that as part of the dress code. Whoever the person is who's running the company, they reserve the right to say our dress code is in effect. So you've got to make sure that you're aware of the dress code of the place that you're working for, and that even though it is not necessarily going to be deemed unconstitutional, it's within my freedom. I'm supposed to be able to wear what I want to wear and say what I want to say, but not necessarily so when it comes to harming or bringing some sort of offense to those persons who may not necessarily be of the same mind. This is when they can actually talk about their dress code being in effect. But in the public, in the open public, I don't think it's going to be deemed a problem. This is really agency specific when it comes to this particular um, issue of fighting words and what you're actually hearing. Because I know some of you may have that question, so it doesn't mean I can't. Yes, you can, but it just depends on the space that you're operating in. Then we come to the fourth unprotected type of, I would say, speech, and this has to do with obscenity. Now, over the years, the Supreme Court of the United States has tried several times to define what is known as obscenity. And the thing about this, you know, I, 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 the thing I'm going to put to you is if you think it's actually easy, just close your eyes for a moment and try to come up with a coherent definition of obscenity. Obscenity has changed over time. What my grandparents defined as obscene, it is now acceptable. What we've defined as obscenity years ago, it's now flipped on the other side. And here are some examples. Working without getting paid, that's obscene. Who works without getting paid? So we've assigned obscenity to mean something just ridiculous. You expect me to work for free? No, I'm not going to work for free. Or getting paid without working, that's also seen as obscene. So these are two cartoons that are really juxtaposing what is happening in the context of a government worker versus poor Mitch, Mitch McConnell, versus somebody who's in you know Congress. You know, these decision makers, policy makers, they're getting paid without working and we're getting a whole lot of work without getting paid. So obscenity really is in the context of our economy and our politics. This is how it's defined. On the, other, on the other hand, maybe somebody who's scantily clad, half naked, in a pool, you might say that's obscene, that is improper. So obscenity in the context of morality and obscenity in the context of what the economy has and the politics, these are two poles of how you might find um, the definition you know, to be in effect when it comes to obscenity. But let's look at it from the context of the court. Now, in one of the early attempts to define obscenity, Justice Stewart famously said, I know it when I see it. How many of you have heard that before? I will know when the person is lying when I hear it. But for this particular judge, he said, I will know it when I see it. So defining obscenity for the court, really, it proved so hard that the court finally gave up and decided to employ a test to determine what actually constitutes obscenity. Enter now what we call the Miller test. So Miller versus California, 1973, in this particular case, Marvin Miller, the proprietor of an adult store, I don't have to tell you what an adult store is, he mailed flyers to promote his business. And what he did, he was not even aware of who's going to open the mail. So given the nature of his business, you would understand why a mother and son, you know, were offended when they opened an envelope to find flyers, all right? Um, I'm going to assume that this is, um, I don't know, but the mother and son. And of course, there are some flyers inside there that Miller was actually advertising. And they called the police and the whole thing escalated to the extent that the case actually landed before the, before the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Why did it actually land there? Because the mother <laughs> found it to be quite offensive. How dare you send flyers advertising your toys before my impressionable son, who's probably just about, what, nine or 10 years old? How dare you, all right? So the court established that any material that meets the Miller's test is actually obscene, it's highly unconstitutional. So here's what happened. In the Miller's test, the first point to note is that whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the period interest the lawyer here is speaking for an unhealthy interest in sex. Then 
huh, we will see if it's going to pass the Miller steps, all right? It has to be really experienced interest. Now, the second point to note in terms of the Miller's test is if the work depicts or describes um, anything in a patently offensive or of a sexual manner, then it's not going to pass the Miller's test. So it's really <laughs> obscene if it's describing anything that is patently offensive or sexual in nature. Then of course, whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, nor that this is a third prong considered as an objective standard and is judged by reference to national rather than subjective community standards. Meaning that if you've got a piece of artwork and the entire community doesn't like it, but nationally speaking, it's seen as, it's seen as adding value to what standards you're trying to bring out in the artistic or literary world or political world, then really it's not obscene, all right? So the whole or the plural society must see the value in it. And you know, it must be deemed as objective by the whole rather than a small group of people. For instance, if there's a piece of artwork and the church comes out and they're like, oh my goodness, that is obscene. How can you have a naked picture there and children are actually in the community? What if really it's, it's a type of, of artwork that is showcasing um, liberation, all right, for a group of people? Um, you know, it's depicting a particular time or era where you know things have changed in society, the end of slavery, for instance, or the abolition, you know, emancipation. Then it's really the larger society that is you know impressed, the larger society that is being catered to in terms of the message behind that particular image that is looked at as being pure or objective, so to speak, and not necessarily subjective. All right. So if one community deems it to be improper, and the entire nation sees the significance or the value of that piece of artwork or that piece of poetry, <laughs> then it really has passed the Miller's test. So those are three. Now I've got an example here. And if any of you have ever traveled to any part of the Caribbean, I'm from the British Caribbean. <laughs> and so I've gone to Jamaica a few times. In other words, a religious community may find that this particular painting of a naked person lacks any value, but in the national artistic community, the same work can be considered a priceless work of art. <laughs> the court is going to say, you know what? The image stands. It is and cannot be deemed to be obscene. So this is the Emancipation Monument. If any of you ever travel to Kingston, Jamaica, you will see an Emancipation Park, um, really a towering image of a black male and a black female. These are two black bodies and they embody emancipation, all right? The story behind this is that they are saying that, you know, the genitals, genitalia, it is just really, you know, huge or it's not representing the black body, but the artist said that they've had to break and fix and all of that. They've had to do a number of things to make sure that they really portray what the black body, the strength of the black body looked like and what in, the, in their nakedness, what these particular people look like and what they represented, strength and courage and resilience and all of these features, because it's not about staring at the naked body. It is about really thinking about the national significance of this piece of artwork, meaning that the Maroons, some of the fiercest people, um, enslaved people, were taken to Jamaica, all right? Um, uh, they were the ones who helped to buy emancipation for the rest of the free states in the Caribbean and other parts. So it is about the national significance and aligning the national significance to the whole. And you're taking that to the Miller's desk. <laughs> Back, if this were in the 1920s, it certainly would not be seen as very, um, you know, proper, so to speak. So it has passed the Miller's test and it will pass the Miller's test because all of us will know and all of you will know that um, Jamaica is a place of uh, cultural um, exportation. There's just a lot of commodification of the culture right now, but they're pretty much known for their art, their music and their poems, their poetry, resistance and redemption song and all of that. It has to do with expressing oneself in the interests of the larger community of people. Now, all three prongs, all three prongs rather, must be met for material to be considered obscene, except for child pornography, which is considered unconstitutional regardless, all right? So there's always this protection of what it is you can expose a child to. And work that appeals to the purient interest, like I said before, and depicts sexual acts in a patently offensive manner, what is believed to has, have artistic value is actually constitutional, despite meeting two out of the three criteria. Excuse me. 
So really, if you go back to this particular picture here, they would have met the artistic interest. And of course, you know, for kids, I'm not sure they're going to see this as pornography, but they're not doing anything. They're not in any sexual pose, but they're standing looking up and out. And so they would have met some sort of standard of objectivity as it relates to the message that they were trying to bring across. And this is not, and the good thing, this is not in the US jurisdiction. This is in the island of Jamaica. But if you were to bring something or if you were to look at other images that you will see at museums across the US depicting different types of culture or the black culture, so to speak, or any other type of culture, you will see that it really has to do with, um, you know, offensive things or that which is patently offensive to people in the context of the imagery and the message. So for more on this, I'd like you to read New York versus what we say forever in 1982 and the full case of Miller versus California um, in 1973, a couple of years earlier. Now we come to the exciting part of this presentation, unprotected speech, defamation. Defamation is basically false communication that harms an individual's reputation, causes the general public to despise or disrespect that person. And of course it will damage their businesses or their employment ultimately. So someone who's defamed because of the lies or the scandal, they're likely to be scorned by members of society. There's a lot of gossip going on and slander going on they'll lose their jobs, their businesses. In this particular culture that we're living in right now, cancel culture, you will find that anyone who is, uh, you know, who's found themselves on the other side of the law, um, you know, in the context of, well, you're trying to stop someone from doing something. There have been a lot of cases where persons have used their cameras um, and individuals have been defamed. It is not necessarily false communication, but they've done things and then, you know, the particular instance or incident went viral and they've lost their jobs. I'd like to say to you in the cases where um, they're not in the wrong, this is when it really becomes false communication. If someone says something about an individual, let's say something is said about a company or a person who's running a company and someone says that, hey, do you know that this individual is involved in a Ponzi scheme? They're actually stealing your money and you're not going to get what they said you were going to get then this particular false communication can cause some serious harm to the individual. They're a very known character. Let's say they're an influence on social media. Disrespect can come to that individual. Of course, they will lose followers and they'll lose influence, ultimately losing business. And so a lot of cases you will find where people are filing for defamation of character and they're winning. It's because the, the, the falsehoods have been really established in the court of law. When people do their investigations, when the attorneys do their investigations, they found in favor of those persons who are actually bringing the case, the plaintiff who's bringing the case against the person who's saying, well, I see, and I know it to be true. No, it's not necessarily true. You're bringing a false communication against the person. So the court will rule in, the, in favor of the plaintiff. And so this is where they will actually say <laughs> that you need to pay the person for a loss of business. And of course you can also <laughs> be fined to pay them for those particular bits and pieces of other damages, such as the counseling they've had to take on the sleepless night as a result of the psychological effects of the false communication on their life and their livelihood. All right. So false communication in the context of defamation is not protected under the Constitution. It's not a protected form of speech. Now, defamation can be that which is written in the form of a defamatory statement and that which is spoken broadcast. Spoken on the television news, you've got a podcast, you're on the radio, whatever is actually said, you're on your own program, you are you're actually in contravention of the constitution because you're slandering or the libel laws will actually kick in. All right. So if defamation can be either libelous, which is a written defamatory statement, all eyes are on you now, or it can be slanderous whereby you're on the television or the radio or whatever it is, whatever platform you're using to broadcast or to defame that particular individual. So remember the distinctions, that which is written and that which is actually said. These will come for your mid-semester. So please, please bear that in mind, that defamation is actually applied in these particular contexts. Now, defamation, 
a defamatory statement must be an assertion of fact rather than mere opinion. It means that there has to be a beyond the shadow of a doubt and it must be capable of being proven to be false. For someone to say that you have defamed their character, it must be something that you've actually said or written that is written as in such a way that you've presented it as factual, all right? And if you have the evidence that that which the person has presented as factual is not truthful, you've got a very strong case. That individual has got a very strong case in the court of law. And this is the reason why a lot of networks are very, very, very careful of finding out. In journalism, we say when in doubt, find out or leave out. Because if you don't want your particular establishment to be cited for defamation, you want to make sure that you're finding out. Because if it is that you have not verified your sources, two or three sources, and the person that you're making the claims against is capable of actually proving what you've said to be false, your assertions, then your company, your establishment, is likely to lose the lawsuit. You may be fired. You may never be assigned to that particular beat again. All right? So it's very, very important to make sure that you're not <laughs> in a defamatory situation. Like I said, if the claim turns out to be truthful, it is not defamation. And of course, it is an unpleasant statement of fact. In this particular instance, you will not be fired. You will be hired over and over again. Other persons may say, hey, you've broken a fantastic story. We really wanted to know who the thief was. We wanted to know who the person was who was giving the scoop, who was giving out the false information about the particular whatever it is. So you've gotten somebody to say something, somebody who's the whistleblower who told on the other person. It's an unpleasant statement of facts that that individual is actually stealing, all right? So your claims that you've written about or you've spoken about, they turn out to be truthful. And so judgment is in favor of the newspaper, the television station, the network um, that has actually <laughs> defamed that individual, not for wrong reasons, but because you want to put the public on their guard with respect to the person's proclivities. All right. Now, a defamatory statement must identify its victim by naming or reasonably implicated the person allegedly defamed. So I've got an example here. William Smith, a senior executive of Goldman Sachs, embezzled $10 million in personal expense of gifts and vacations. So we know that William Smith is named here. And so William, William Smith has a case. If William Smith was nowhere near the embezzlement, William Smith has been off on leave. William Smith can say, hey, you guys need to pay me for a loss of sleep. You need to pay me damages. You need to pay me for defaming my name because I was not there. You've named me as the person in the story, all right? If William Smith is not named, then William Smith does not have a case in this particular instance of defamation. In Rosenblatt versus Beer in 1966, Beer actually argued that he was defamed in an article about a ski resort he was supervising. The article had asked the question, what happened to all the money last year and every other year. And Bear actually claimed that the article was implying that he had been skimming money. And this is what the court said. The court was saying that, you know, this was not explicitly stated in the article. They ruled that because he was not named in the article and the claims were not stated as a matter of fact, it was just really this whole notion of, I wonder what ever happened to, you know. It was basically teasing out and he picked the bait and he was like, well, I think they're asserting that it's me. But the court is like, you have no standing to sue because you were not named in this particular case. All right. So every time you think about someone filing a claim or you've heard or you've seen those particular stories, think about the ways in which they were directly named or their names were called in a newspaper, whether they're named a broadcast or the newspaper, um, just make sure that they're in their rights and that it's being actually interpreted correctly. Then we come to commercial speech that is false, misleading, or, connect, or concerning illegal activity. Commercial speech concerning illegal activity, example, if you're advertising illegal drugs, this is not protected because you can actually be cited in the court of law for actually promoting illicit drugs or the use of illicit drugs, all right? If you're actually promoting heroin or, you know, cocaine, it's not like you're advertising for people to stay away from being addicted or whatever it is, or steps to actually become, you know, loose from the drug or whatever it is. Um, if it's commercial that is actually advertising the use, then the, the advertiser can be brought before the court. 
Again, if it's false or misleading, when it comes to claiming that a product does something that it's really do, not doing, it is not protected speech. But this is actually up for debate because what advertisers have countered in the past is that you people as consumers are supposed to be real rational thinkers. You're supposed to be able to know when it's the truth and when it's not the truth. You should test things for yourself. That's their defense, all right? And this is when we come to the ethical nature now of advertising. Not the legal nature right now. We're talking about the ethical, which we'll come to later on in the semester as we progress. But false or misleading commercial speech is definitely not protected under the Constitution. If you claim that someone is going to lose 10 pounds in one day, really, that is not, it is not, and I repeat, that is not humanly possible, all right? What if a product, you know, this is a quick fix. In, 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 in five seconds, you will see your teeth change color, all right? That is really misleading, all right? And a lot of people have brought commercial um, entities, they have brought advertisers to task for these types of things in terms of selling, selling products, manufactured products. Now, after the gas crisis of 1973, and I'm bringing a real case to you, um, the New York Public Service Commission banned energy companies from promoting energy consumption in an attempt to encourage people to conserve energy. So as a result of this particular ban, after the crisis ended, what Central Hudson Gas and Electric wanted to do was to run ads to encourage people to consume their energy. Um, it would be a violation of the ban, actually. All right? But this is what happened. They sued the, public, the, 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 the commission and they claimed that it violated their First Amendment. And so the Supreme Court really took the case and they said, you know what? The central Hudson test is what we will use to determine whether government can actually restrict commercial speech. All right? So this is what the court said. The court said that if the speech concerns lawful activity and it's not false or misleading, the government can regulate it. So if there's nothing law, you know, unlawful about the activity, or if there's nothing misleading about what it is they're actually saying, the government can regulate, you know, and, and the government can only regulate it under these particular circumstances. The alleged impact to the government is substantial. The regulation directly advances the government's interest in, in, in which the issue is asserted. And of course, the regulation is much more extensive than is necessary to serve the interests expressed in the third step, all right? So again, I'll go back that. If the speech concerns lawful activity and is not false or misleading, the government can regulate the speech on the basis of their interests in the speech, in the, in the sense that the regulation directly advances their interests. And of course, it should not be more extensive than necessary to serve the government's interests. So in this particular case, <laughs> these are the only ways in which they can actually reg regulate the speech on the basis of their own interests in that particular, um, uh, you know, advertising. Now, for, in terms of the Central Hudson test, this is just a standalone test, as happened in Brandenburg and Miller, um, but the Supreme Court actually applied a strict scrutiny. Um, you recall this from the First Amendment session. It is asking the government to prove it has substantial interest, which is the restriction addresses, um, and that the restriction is not overbroad. We spoke about that which is overbroad, meaning it really contravenes the First Amendment and of course the restrictions. A little later on, we're gonna talk about the gag order and that which you know, the state can actually restrict in terms of information. But for now, we're gonna talk about the fact that the standalone test here um, applied strict scrutiny in the course of actually deciding what can be regulated. So for more, you can read the Central Hudson Gas and Electric versus Public Service Commission case of 1980, and that will give you some more information with respect to this particular test. There are a couple of cases that um, will help you to understand speech um, distinctions um, and the First Amendment, and this has to do with Brandenburg versus Ohio, which I touched on earlier, Virginia versus Black 2003, Texas versus Johnson 1989, Cohen versus California 1971, New York versus Ferber 1982, and then we go to Central Hudson and Gas Electric versus the Public Service Commission. If you click on these and you go to your browser and you get these cases, you want the briefs. You don't necessarily want the entire case and all of the argument, but you want to know what happened and the outcome. So make sure that you're clicking in your browser and you're looking for these cases in brief in terms of the overview, the thrust of the case, and of course the ruling. So I will be with you shortly.
um, to share with you for the rest of the week in terms of what we have set out in the module. And so our next session is actually going to be looking at access, journalistic privilege, freedom of information, the Freedom of Information Act, and of course, open records. So I'll stop right here for now in terms of today's presentation, and then we'll continue on with our next presentation.